Hello, everybody. Welcome to another great conversation from the team at Reuters Events. We are talking today about discovering the benefits of AI-based claims decisioning to reduce loss ratios and improve outcomes. I'm Brian Falchuk. I'm your moderator for today's discussion. I'm the managing partner of Insurance Evolution Partners and the author of the book series, The Future of Insurance from Disruption to Evolution. And I talk about some of this AI-based stuff in those books. So if you've read them, you're already on the right start. But we are going to get into a great conversation today. We talk about the widespread introduction of technologies that focus on taking out costs and increasing efficiency that a lot of us have already implemented to, to get to that bottom line, but maybe there's more we can do. And more specifically, what can we do that's actually going to create a material market advantage for us? The next step to achieving that competitive differentiation and advantage without compromising on customer experience, our employees' experience, and making sure we have tech that drives accurate quality decisioning at scale and ties together, right? So is it integrated or we do, do we just have a series of sort of disjointed things that we're throwing at the problem, but is there a cohesive approach to the whole thing? These are the kinds of things we're gonna be talking about today. And I am joined by a fantastic panel. We have Zach Gordon, who is the Senior Director for National Homeowners Claims at CSAA Insurance Group, one of the AAA insurers. We have Lori Pond, who's the Director of Claim Strategy and Innovation at the Auto Club Group, another AAA insurer. And Tom Harrington, who does not join us from a AAA insurer, but is the Global Director of Product Marketing at Shift Technologies. It's not going to be the AAAs versus me and Tom, but uh, <laughs> instead it's going to be a much more collaborative conversation. And the great thing about that is we're collaborating with all of you in the audience. So please, as this conversation is going on, you will have questions. Pop them in the Q&A. There's a little button at the bottom of your screen, not the chat, the Q&A button. Pop them right in there. I will keep my eyes on that. And that's what's going to guide so much of our conversation. We'll start with some opening thoughts, but then it's all about what you want us to be talking about. So please do put those questions in the Q&A. With that, Zach, if you don't mind kicking things off since I introduced you first, you get the first word. Welcome to the conversation. Thank you, Brian. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Zach Gordon. I'm the uh, Senior Director for National Homeowner Claims at CSAA uh, Insurance Group, which is a AAA insurer. Um, and today we get to discuss, as Brian stated, the benefits of, of AI. I also throw in technology. So the benefits of AI and technology-based claims decisioning, kind of really understanding the benefits of, of technology on loss ratios, and then also the benefits of technology on, on claims outcomes. Um, you know, I think there's a lot to unpack with this topic, and I think each there's many subjects, I think, within the topic that uh, have their own conference, um, and if they don't have their own conference, I think they shortly will um, have their own conference. Um, the perspective that I would like to take, at least for this conversation, is really kind of looking at the topic through the lens of, of homeowners or property claims. Uh, that's my, um, you know, my specific uh, area of interest. Um, you know, but also kind of looking at it through property claims, but also kind of simplifying as what more can carriers do to attack loss costs uh, to drive a market advantage. And I think that that was kind of a notation, I think, in the publication for this conversation. So what can carriers do? Um, so I guess some of the things that kind of come to my mind, and uh, this is probably going to be a gross understatement, but carriers obviously need to continue to invest in technology, right? We need to continue to invest in our platforms. We need to continue to partner with uh, insure techs and third-party vendors. Um, the work that's being done in that in the insure tech space is just absolutely incredible. And I think it's, an, it's a noble mission as well. The work that all of you and, and everyone in the insure, te insure tech space is doing, uh, the mission uh, to make life easier for, you know, for folks that you know, endure or experience uh, something that's inconvenient. And that really kind of levels against all areas of the spectrum, meaning simple things that are inconvenient or, you know, terrible tragedy, you know. So, you know, when I think of investing in technology, it's also ensuring that we have systems that are, are integrated. It's not just buying a lot of cool tech, but it's also ensuring that the tech can communicate. Um, and if it doesn't communicate, then obviously we're at a further disadvantage. Departments within carriers, whether it's claims or underwriting, subrogation, you know, SIU, they, they need to be able to communicate and we need to communicate tomorrow better than we do today. Um, you know, and I think of AI and technology and, and the example, an example that jumps to my mind is, is an underwriting example. And I think we're starting to see a lot of this in the market is, uh, you know, you have the ability through different rules engines 
uh, to really take or look at a property, look at anything that's posted online, look at assessor information, create a profile, really kind of understanding if the profile of the property has changed, if, uh, if there's renovations that have been done, are there noted hazards that have changed over time? Um, if there's been an addition, uh, we know in our world, there's been a, an incredible real estate you know, boom uh, up till recently, uh, heavy emphasis on remodeling. So a lot of the profiles of existing properties have changed. We need to know that so that the insurability of those risks are acknowledged, they're noted, they're understood, um, and that the policies and the coverages reflect those changes. It's important that underwriting um, identifies those changes, I think, before claims does. <laughs> because if claims identify a risk or a change uh, to a property, um, then probably something already bad has happened. But also, I think claims needs to have the advantage of understanding what is in the underwriting file. And that information, I think, you know, needs to continue to be shared at a more efficient rate as it is today. So I think those are some of the things that I think of in that space. Um, I also think that companies need to continue to invest in cybersecurity. Um, you know, we need to protect the information of our members. We need to protect the information of our employees. We need to protect our systems, um, our algorithms, and everything that we do as a, as a company. And I think that is something that is continuously discussed. You know, we read about something different in the news every day, but cybersecurity, I think, is, is paramount. Um, you know, and if I dive in a little further, kind of thinking of it from the claims perspective, you know, I think looking at technology, I think claims, we really need to kind of understand what we can automate and what claims we can automate and then what processes that we can automate. Um, it's really important, obviously, and I think that conversation will change over time as the technology gets better. So we will be able to automate more claims and more processes as time goes on. But I think for those claims and those processes that we cannot automate, I think we need to ensure that we have a highly skilled workforce uh, that can address you know, those outlier claims or those highly sophisticated complex claims that can't be automated. So I think the skills of the future for adjusters are going to be different. You have adjusters that might handle simple claims now, where in the future, maybe the average claim that they handle will be more complex. And as an insurance carrier to control loss costs, we need to continue to invest in our folks and our people um, because they will be handling more complex matters um, in the future. So having a team of specialized adjusters that can handle more sophisticated claims, um, but also I think partnering that with an um, operating model that is simplistic. The customers, as the world kind of evolves, customers wanna do business in their own way and simplifying that interaction is, is paramount, it's indispensable. So I think having an operating model that ensures that the customer interacts with as few people as possible and those that they interact with have those requisite skills that I discussed previously, that they can take the claim, adjust the claim, write the estimate, resolve the coverage, and then settle the claim. I think that's the way of the future. It's that simplistic approach that I think a lot of the public is demanding. Um, not just from their insurance carriers, but how they interact with other vendors and, and in other parts of society. So I think that's something um, that I think about as well. Um, you know, one other thing that I would probably add is, is kind of the flip side of the technology, I guess the statements that I made is that I think carriers need to understand what they cannot automate. I think there are certain claims and I think that there are certain um, examples or scenarios where they should not be automated, they should not be virtually adjusted, because when we talk about loss costs, we also talk about expenses, we talk about efficiencies, we talk about service, they're all kind of interdependent, interconnected. So if we automate or if we try to virtually adjust a claim that is not prudent, then we create more work and more inefficiency. Um, a claim that if we try to automate and the claim is contested by the insured or their representatives, it could result in on-site inspections, it can result in further investigation, it could cause us to kind of start the claims process over, which would then extend cycle times, it'll extend loss of use, it'll extend other loss costs and probably make the claim a lot more expensive and like I said, a lot more inefficient. So. Again, those are the things that I kind of think about, um, you know, when I'm thinking about this topic. And again, I know that there's a lot to unpack, but those are kind of some of the high level things that I think about. So, um, Brian, Lori, I, I guess I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, 
Zach, I was like, um, oh, I'll use this point as I segue into Lori. And then you said something else. I was like, no, I'll use that one. These are, <laughs> these are great points you're making. I mean, we're talking about um, looking at the whole picture. Are there specific kinds of claims that we should, or to your last point, shouldn't automate? Are there pieces of the process that yes and others, maybe that's not ideal. Or there's another nuance you put in there where these are decisions at a moment in time, a year from now, six months from now, 10 years from now, whatever it is, all of those lines that we draw may vary and may be moving as new technologies and approaches and thinking come out. And the other point you made that I think was so critical is the people side is we're talking about making technology decisions, but to make that in a vacuum without, well, what does that mean for our people and the training and the skill set and the profile of folks that are going to be most appropriate to use those tools and use them successfully. Um, so I ended up pulling multiple points as the segue, but uh, it's it's your fault. You, you said too many good things, but fantastic. And um, I'm sure that sparked a lot of questions for folks. So it's a nice reminder to people to put them in the Q&A. We can dig into all of this. Um, but thank you for all that. Lori, would you, would you like to go next? And I know you will come with equally amazing points and I will have just as much trouble, but love to hear your perspective from ACG. Thank you, Brian. It's great to join the discussion today. Zach, you really did unpack a lot of luggage. But the good thing about what you shared is it's a commonality across uh, the PNC ecosystem or the insurance ecosystem. Uh, Auto Club Group, uh, much like CSA is a AAA insurer, we're the second largest club in North America. Our footprint covers 14 states and two US territories. We have 13 million members. We are a membership organization and we insure 2 million vehicles in over 900,000 homes. So I am definitely in Zach's camp related to the intersection of partnership, prediction, process improvement, and people. Uh, I am fortunate enough to lead our uh, claim innovation team, and I have oversight for our strategic roadmap. And amongst those responsibilities is really to deliver a reimagined experience for both our customers. And our customers include both our external customers and our internal customers. So I have the privilege of collaborating with the line of business, with technical partners, finance, underwriting, product. It's a really exciting time in our industry with all this enabling technology. It really allows us to make more informed decisions, leveraging people, process, technology, and data. Our innovation team in particular evaluates intelligent automation, leveraging AI, ML, computer vision, DL, all of the great you know, alphabet soup of acronyms out there. And we need all four of those P's working together, particularly our partners, uh, our predictive models, our process improvement arm, and our people. So how do we get these four P's it, working together harmoniously? It's all about learning. It's all about resilience. It's not always perfect but we are committed uh, within my team to ensure effortless experiences for our customers and our staff. So one of the things that we consistently evaluate is do we build or do we buy? So over the past several years, what I've seen us do at ACG is really evaluate innovative tech companies, IoT, InsureTech, FinTech, across that landscape to see, can you materially improve RCX? Can you materially offer us a way to deliver effortless experiences. So the customer effort is very low, whether it's internal or external. So we're, we are leveraging IA and insights at scale to deliver that best in class claim experience. And I have a couple of examples. In particular, just this year, we rolled out uh, a predictive algorithm in our auto fiscal damage process. So Zach is covering home, so thank you, Zach. And I wanted to focus on auto fiscal damage uh, I have seen across the industry, APD being a, uh, a line of business that really has a lot of great tools. There's a sea of different tools. So how do you evaluate the tools and what's gonna drive impact? We recently partnered with our APD Estimatics vendor to send key claim data points that allows us to leverage and build an AI algorithm that allows us to identify the most optimal inspection methods. So we are not, recommending that we send one of our field adjusters to so a boot on the ground to look at a $500 predictive repair. So it allows us to hone what is going to be the easiest inspection experience for our customers. And then are we leveraging our staff, much like Zach said, to go look at vehicles that really could benefit from that additional eye and the human talent. So we are using data to better inform those decisions. We have tweaked those algorithms at least twice um, in our journey. We're, we're passing things like the geo, 
uh, the VIN, did we did airbags deploy? Uh, what are the impact points? And it's really allowed us to deliver a much better decision from our contact center all the way through our adjusting communities. So that particular initiative, we're seeing better loss costs, lower cycle time, and we're just seeing more impactful decision-making on how we use our human talent. And a a fast, uh, fastly adjudicated claim and a pay claim is typically a happy claim. And we're happy to see that this optimal vehicle inspection method using and leveraging AI and ML is really driving the needle for us. One other uh, example I have is we're partnering with our bi-directional insurtech vendor. So we offer our customers the ability to communicate directly through SMS with our adjusting community. We offer it um, at FNOL for our auto physical damage claims. And we are now currently alpha testing AI powered sentiment analysis with a core group of adjusters across our ecosystem to include auto and home. And what we're doing is we're using AI at scale to, and we tuned up our algorithms. So it's, we're working with our vendor to say, this is very likely a claim that you need to touch. Today, you can have a series of chats in your view and how do you know what to touch? And the flag on these messages is signaling you, you probably have a customer service recovery opportunity. So we had some analysis prior, but it required digging in to the analytics widget. And now we are surfacing those uh, chats, leveraging AI, for an immediate at scale response to go in and make the recovery before you, you know, you just don't have that second chance. Uh, one other uh, project that I can think of that we engaged in recently where we're leveraging AI is we just completed a proof of value leveraging business process mining. And we passed over uh, data from one of our primary claim systems in a, a very short two month POV. And we analyzed 150,000 payments, 130,000 claims, and the kind of data that we were getting at scale, the modeling that was leveraged through our BPM software really helped us identify choke points, opportunities for improvement. We were able to blend our CSAT measurements in. So at every step in the process, we were able to see process nonconformities, friction, cycle time, uh, average cost per claim. And it was such a powerful instrument to really help inform where we need to make process improvement, where we need to improve decisioning, where we need to uh, reduce friction. So I'm really excited uh, with some of the initiatives that we've had. And the last one I'll address is our AAA Drive telematics application. We offer this free to our members, whether or not you buy our use space insurance or not. So we're leveraging IOT here to help produce a, a safe driving score. It measures your driving habits, interaction with your phone, hard braking, speeding. Uh, so it's like having a driving coach as your co-pilot. And it's helping us as AAA improve the safety of our roads. And you also have purview for the drivers in your household that have the app installed. So those are just a few examples of how we're leveraging AI to improve how we reimagine our claim experience, how we prioritize tech. And I'm just so excited uh, with all of our partners allowing us to A-B test, inviting us into design thinking sessions. This is really becoming a way more collaborative discussion and it's just a great time to be an intern. Back to you, Brian. Those are, those are great examples. And I, I like this note you just ended on that um, you didn't call anyone a vendor or even a supplier, which sounds a little bit nicer than vendor, but it's I think it's because of what you're describing is it's not just we bought this thing, we put it in and, and it's just there and no one's thinking about it. We just pay once a year or, or whatever. Um, it's about building something together. And you talked about tweaking algorithms and figuring out how do we use this tool to not replace our people or think about shortening the process or cutting things out, but make our people that much more effective because we're able to point and shoot them more effectively. Um, these are all very collaborative, interactive kinds of ideas. Um, even down to your members is, look, whether you're using this to get a discount on your insurance or not, or buy a different product, use this and be safer drivers and have a family conversation as someone who's soon having a teenage driver. I'm, I'm all for that. Um, to think more collaboratively, I think across the piece, your people, your partners, your members, um, that's the right way to be thinking about AI and not just like, or we're just going to cut this out of the process, whether it's a person or a step or, or what have you. So I appreciate that. Um, thank you for that, Lori. Tom, you see across so many different applications of this stuff, different carriers. I'd love to hear your perspective as well. 
Yeah, I appreciate it, Brian, as well as Zach and Lori teed me up pretty well with some great, there's so many great points as as, the, as we've already mentioned that we can be covering here. But I think, you know, as, as, as an insure tech looking at the market and seeing what the market needs are in particular as AI is evolving, you know, really I, I, we're seeing a common theme develop. And I think that common theme really starts with simplicity. And, and what carriers can do to become more simplistic. I mean, obviously there isn't a carrier in the world right now that isn't doing some kind of, in, some making some form of investment around digital transformation to drive improvement and the things they can do to start to drive new value for the end consumers of, of their products, right? And I think as you start to look at that simplicity, there's been a, a fundamental gap that, that happens a lot of times in many carrier environments that while you know, aspirationally, the market could be looking at, you know, potentially looking at ways they could begin to automate, you know, total or partial processes up to say 50% of the types of claims they process. Today, on average, you're actually seeing that they're only able to process about 7%, right? And I think that that speaks to the fact that it's really the, the simplistic cases that they're able to touch and are able to start to drive additional value around as they're looking at that. Really those one size fits all examples that live within the carrier environment. But you know, what those numbers tell me is, is I think about that, it means that there's 93% out there potentially that don't that aren't one size fit all examples, right, of the types of cases, and there is complexity wrapped around that. And it's how do carriers start to think about that complexity differently and begin to start to find new ways to really infuse what I'll call context into, into those situations. So when you have a claim that comes forward, what, what's the context that requires somebody's time and effort, right, to be able to review something? What, what requires a different path based off of what that context is informing you? And I think those are the types of things that AI is ideally suited to help build into the, the claims process moving forward. I think there's a couple of things, you know, that, that I'll say as, as we look at our customers, you know, we're seeing a big push that around not just the end user experience and what you can do for your policyholders and insured or even their agents or brokers that maybe attend to that process, but there's also a big push for that claims handler, right? To be able to start to look at them differently and be able to understand how you support them in a different way. In particular, given what's gone on over the course of the last two years, where you know, two years ago, there were large claims operations that lived in central locations where it wasn't hard for claims organization to have a people in an organization to have a conversation above desks or cross office. You know, that's all, that's by and large a virtual experience today as you're starting to see that expand. So how do you start to figure out how you can scale expertise through that model? I think Zach used a great example. How, do, how are we skilling people appropriately based off of the types of events we want them to handle? And providing the right support. I think you're going to see AI start to play an even more pertinent role or larger role in that type of example as carriers find ways to support those people differently. I think a couple of examples that we're seeing the market begin to focus on, you know, we're seeing the market start to really focus on that upfront experience, right? So really focus on claims intake, point of FNOL, and what kinds of things can you do to start to drive a, a, a simpler process from go around that experience. Now, that's always been something the market has is focused on. It's been a key, key moment of truth for many carriers. And I think that there's been a lot of investment around the experience across channels, but it's now it's how am I using that experience to help me drive towards that better overall loss outcome and that lower loss cost ideally for both parties as you look at what's beneficial for both. And we're seeing things start to, to impact sooner. How can I start to drive you know, decisions differently earlier in that process to begin to start to you know, figure out the right path, to figure out the right intervention model, to figure out you know, the things I may choose to treat differently based off of what the data is telling. So seeing a big thrust around there, in particular around areas like, like liability assessment, right? And to be able to understand earlier, what is that? How do I handle that differently? I, I think again, to both your points, you know, Zach and Laurie, how do I get that to the right handler based off of what I'm seeing earlier in that process, right? It's always been a goal, but how do I start to accelerate that? I think we're also seeing, you know, how things, how AI can start to impact things like, for example, documents, right? Just look at what's happening in the claim space around documents, still very much a document heavy uh, operation when you start to think about what's required. How do you start to use AI and intelligence to start to, to look at documents, a police report, an estimate, an invoice to pull out what's relevant within that? and prompt the adjuster or handler with the right detail to start to drive in the outcome, as opposed to have them be forced to fish through all that information to then divine based off of their own personal experience, what's relevant, right? I think that that's a big piece, right? How do you start to scale something consistently that you can leverage across that population to help make them more effective and drive more value in the organization? 
So I think I think generally, you know, what we're seeing is is that there's a, a growing appetite and a growing imp, you know, emphasis on the importance of decisions, and where decisions live within that claims environment, and how do you start to begin to prompt that, you know, through through your claims operations, through your claims technology stack in a complementary way, that actually can help somebody be a little more effective and start to drive on that, because I think those are the things as carriers are looking at those those types of decisions that they deliver impact are actually going to help them get after those total loss cost numbers are trying to get at, try to look differently at way, maybe ways to automate parts of processes or processes differently than they've been able to do thus far. And I think that's where we're seeing a lot of emphasis in market today. I, lo I love using this word decisions instead of AI. And it's not to say it isn't AI, but AI is the tech. And we all know you don't sell the tech, you sell the sizzle, right? You, right. We're not, we're not in the uh, hammer looking for a nail kind of space. That's, that's what a lot of these buzzwords end up being for so many years. And when we talk about decisions, I think as insurance professionals, we get that. That's what we have to do every day, especially in claims. Multiple decisions, lots of complexity. And Tom, to your point, we might be doing that just fine on that one document we're looking at. And we can handle that. And we're used to handling that. And then we put the PDF back in the file and we move on to the next one. But not only did we miss the chance to have help in that decision, we also missed the chance for the information in that document that we processed to go into a broader decision-making you know, approach and algorithm and, and uh, guidance to our peers because it was just locked up in a PDF. So even something as simple as, it's not simple, it's actually quite complex, but as seemingly simple as we had this document, we got tons of them in the claim file, that's not data, that's just information. How do we turn that into data and then use that towards our future decisions? You know, one example of, of many that are out there. Yeah, I'll just add real quickly that, Brian, yeah. I think even as, as you think about that, right, that it's not just even the document, right? It's the document in the context of the claim itself, yeah. right? The claims data that's the third party data that's there. How do you start to drive relevance around that to be able to drive the right level of engagement based off of the outcome you're trying to achieve? Right. Right, absolutely. And there's so much going on, Lori, to your point, like very exciting time in the industry because of all these different things that are brewing. And I think each of you has talked about the interconnection here. You know, Zach, you talked about integration, but then saying it's really about the solutions communicating with each other. Tom, to your point in the context, that's one of the ways to bring it is, you know, it was just the uh, computer vision, you know, use my phone to adjust my auto claim kind of stuff that's happening in a vacuum to generate dollars to size the claim. But what about all the other things going on? And if these solutions could communicate, uh, Lori, to your part on partnering, you know, if they can partner together and, and create that context of all these different point solutions, that's a, a whole other level. And I, I feel like this is that moment where it's starting to happen. Um, that connection is, is starting to be enabled, which moves us past the hammer looking for the nails kind of situation we've been in for, for a little while. Um, very exciting. If insurance is exciting, this is it, right? Um, we do have a question already. I have a ton of questions I've been writing down as we go, and I know the audience has even more, but I'm going to lead off with this one. And Zach, it was directed to you, but I'd love to hear this from everyone. And it's around, uh, the person's point was, in your experience, what's a reasonable percentage of homeowners claims that can be automated? Obviously speaking to both sides of your equation, the what to automate from a claims and a process standpoint, but also equally what should you not automate? So maybe you can shed some light on that. And Lori, love to get your, your views on auto. Um, Tom, you know, across the piece, what you're seeing, but what I'd love to get from all of you to add to this is, are we seeing a shift? So, you know, aside from where we should be, um, where are we and where's the movement happening? Where are we starting to invest in, in maybe getting to that Nirvana state? Um, so Zach, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, it's an excellent question. And, and, you know, my first thought is, you know, a percentage of claims, it, it's really, it's kind of a, kind of a snapshot in time, you know, if there's a catastrophe, um, I might be able to automate a higher uh, portion of my claims, depending on the types of loss, uh, losses that I'm receiving. Uh, we had a California event some time ago, where primarily you're looking at fence losses, maybe some lower complex exposures. So instead of thinking about the percentage of claims, kind of thinking through, in my mind, the types of claims at this point, um, I think kind of where the industry is, I think having the ability to automate fence claims and possibly some like some lower, maybe lower complex or lower exposure personal property claims 
claims. Um, I think those are the type of claims that I think really where the industry can kind of grab hold of and, and kind of run with. Um, so I, I think that's kind of where my mind goes. When I think of home, and I'm sure that there's other examples that, that aren't on the top of mind, but I also think about kind of where we're going in that shift. And I, I think we're starting to see you know, home technology, uh, not just the internet of things, but, you know, I think at some point, um, you know, sensors on your, on your, um, you know, uh, in your house, you know, water sensors on your floor, on your water main. Uh, I think, you know, when you have, for example, like a water loss, it's hard to automate that claim because there's some other complexities and coverage that exist. You have to know what caused it. You have to know how long it's been ongoing. And, and oftentimes you got to put, you got to put eyes on it. Um, so, but I think in the future, you're going to have the ability to take that information, process it, know from the sensors and what the house is telling you in real time when it happened, resolve the coverage issue effectively, you know, immediately, where at least at a point where you know that you're going to have coverage for some damage, you might have to resolve some plumbing coverage at some other point, depending on why it failed. But the reality is, I think that shift is starting to happen. More people are, are integrating more technology into their homes. Sharing it, I think, is going to be a whole other conversation about privacy and, and how much people really want others to know about how they live, how much laundry they do, how much water they use, who knows. Um, but I think that, that that is starting to take effect. Um, we have um, Dr. Theresa Young. Uh, she's, she leads our claims process and risk team. Uh, she does a fantastic job. And, and her team are kind of um, you know uh, creating some of these kind of future processes for our company. So it's really exciting. But I think that shift is happening now. But those are the kind of claims. And then the percentage of, of you know, how many of those claims exist will vary from catastrophe or exposure you know, from time to time. So it'll just change. But that, that's kind of where my mind goes on, on that topic. So. Yeah, I think that's well said. You didn't say it depends, but it does depend. And there's good reasons for that. It depends on the right. space that you're in and what kinds of claims mix you see. If you're high value homeowners or you're sort of covering the market, there's there's lots of different questions here. Um, yeah, great, great points. Lori, how about yourself? What are some some views? Maybe I'm more on the auto side. Yeah, well, I want to say that I agree with Zach on the home side. There is more complexity involved in that coverage decision. And just recently, Brian, we met with a partner that was looking at computer vision to automate the home process. And I asked, I asked the partner, I said, uh, how are you making that decision? And they did come and say, well, the coverage decision has to be evaluated by the adjuster or by maybe it's first notice of loss. So I do think there are more complexities. I'm seeing uh, more use cases that are fully robust and developed. Uh, mm. We are moving a large percentage of our auto inspections based on the model and based on the data to photo based estimating. And we're working with our APDS estimatics vendor to model out a straight through process depending on the severity of the claim. So I'm seeing much more uh, really take right there and success there. I'm also seeing uh, to Thomas's point, uh, being able to evaluate structured and unstructured data and really recommend next best action or summarize a large package of information so that you're really directing the adjuster to the pieces of uh, the collateral that makes sense that would drive the evaluation and investigation uh, next steps. So I definitely see that uh, as more impactful um, on the auto side and we're, we're getting to those type of, of processes much faster than on the home side, for sure. Uh you're hinting at something that I'm going to, I want to raise that, uh, that I think is coming up in what both of you are saying, but I'm curious, Tom, if you hit on this at all, but uh, if not, I'll save my question and then we can jump in. But thank you for that, Lori. Tom, what about you? What do you think, um, you know, in terms of, of adoption, is there a correct percentage out there? Are there things we can do to move that needle? Yeah, there certainly are. And what I, what I think we're seeing you know, happen across the base, and, I, and to be honest with you, I think we're seeing auto be a little ahead of property right now, but seeing the property appetite increase, Zach, as we talked about in our preparation, I think there's certainly you know, an appetite to look at where we can start to build out more there. But I think generally starting to look for, you know, more beyond the margin, more beyond sort of the thresholds and margins. I think today when you think about, you know, what a lot of straight through processing is, is sort of a rote number, 
at the end of it to say, okay, I will straight through process if it's X number of dollars, right? Percentage of that, right? And that's sort of a black and white evaluation of how you start to look at that straight through process or any kind of automation generally. I think what we're starting to see is how do I start to, how do carriers start to get into that gray area a little more and start to understand that with the proliferation of data, with all the stuff that's coming from IoT and home and all the different data sources that are out there, that I can start to move that margin a little bit further in certain directions. Now, it may not be absolute, it's going to be for certain claim types, certain situations, clearly, but how do I get a little more detailed as I think about automation today than or really nuanced to a certain extent than I have been today? Because I think it really has been, yeah, here's the threshold and that's it. Anything below above below that, great. Anything above that line that automatically goes to some kind of human adjusted process, right? So how do you start to try more a greater tapestry there as you start to think about what that the data is enabling you to see? I think that that's really the, the appetite right now. How do I start to move that in, incrementally by getting more comfortable? comfortable with what those things are layering in AI into that process as well as self-learning, because once you get comfortable with that AI layered into that, that the decisions the AI is delivering are you're comfortable with as a business and the outcomes are positive, start to let that self run and then get to the next level of complexity and the next level of complexity as you're driving on. So I think it's it's still very much an incremental process, but I think there's an appetite to start to look to beyond. And I think you kind of hit at it, hit on it in the opening, you know, Brian, that I think carriers have looked at a lot at the expense side and what they can get yeah. out of that stone. And it's how do I start to really start to look at that big bucket of loss, right? And see what I can do to be better there. Cause that's really the next opportunity and the next frontier, I think for most carriers. And I think they need to find new ways to tackle that, which is why seeing sort of that incremental approach begin to start to proliferate a little more within market. Yeah. And it's on your, oh yeah, sorry, Zach, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say kind of just to kind of, uh, add on top of what Tom was stating. You know, I know a lot of carriers when they automate or when they try to kind of streamline process, they look at cost or they look at value of a claim. Uh, you know, I know that um, we're kind of looking at complexity as well. Cause I mean, you know, you could have a, you could have a very kind of uh, like example, you could have a water loss and you could have flooring damage throughout the house. It's a, it's a high end, you know, oak floor or a high end redwood type wooding uh, wood floor. And again, it, it's expensive, but the adjustment of the claim isn't very sophisticated. Um, and so it's, it's complexity as well to kind of consider as we move forward too is, um, is, is something that, you know, kind of we're working on because you could also have a car hit, a, hit the side of a garage and you have complex frame framing, code work, uh, but maybe the value isn't as high uh, comparatively. So those are things that we're thinking of as well. Yeah. Um, you know, hitting on complexity, a lot of us just think of dollars or it's one of the many thresholds and it's an automatic threshold. If it's over this, it's, you know, it can't go through the STP. It can't this, it can't that. Um, in this environment, if we said a $10,000 $10, auto claim is not so much anymore, a homeowner's claim right. with what exactly. the supply chain has been doing and the labor side has been doing, um, that could be a really minor claim. Whereas two years ago, actually, it was substantial enough that maybe that was the appropriate threshold to start you know, pulling things out of the automation path. The automation gets better, but also those costs have skyrocketed dramatically. Um, so having more uh, flexibility, fluidity in those decision points is we're all living that absolutely right now. Um, Laurie, I said, there's something you were saying that I wanted to touch on and it was spot on. It's this notion of, and, and I see these are like warning signs. If you hear someone say, oh, we can't because, or, oh, this has to be because so you said like, oh, that has to be, um, you know, handled by this kind of person because there's a coverage issue or a coverage question, or we have to determine coverage. Historically, sure. Um, and that may still be true, but is that something where we're starting to see, and I'm curious to all of you, are we starting to see some of these historic, um, you know, sacred cows off limits? Oh, this has to be because that's how we've always done it moments because the technology's progressed or our understanding of the data has progressed. So now some of these sacred cows maybe don't have to be. Are you, Lori, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick this to you to start with, but are there any that you're seeing where we've been able to start to move on these impossibilities? That's a really, really great uh, topic that you brought up, Brian. Our process mining pilot really helped us look at the number of touches we were making for claim, the number of actors uh, or team members uh, participating in the claim and did it add value. We were looking at things like, this is how many payments we are sending up for manager approval and did the estimate or the recommendation to pay for all of these different uh, gateways and quality checks that we have in our estimatic software, is there a delta? If there isn't a delta, then what is the benefit 
of our manager doing another look-see. Yeah. So uh, one of the cool things with the AI powered process mining is you're able to quantify that. You're able to see and start to look at things like why are we, uh, your, your supplement activity. And so we're, we're tweaking a lot of our processes and we are questioning to your point, some of those sacred cows. Like it's not just a banding analysis of where the average paid claim needs to be is the human talent really making a difference when we invoke that senior level of leadership looking at something that our claim specialist or our claim adjusting team made the right decision and, and was empowered and the software has the right rules that surfaced any the major concerns and could we take a more risk-based approach instead of just being formulaic so i'm already seeing that at acg yeah zach any anything on your end on that one you know, I don't know. I mean, there's there, there's a lot of things, I mean, you know, to kind of, I guess I would say unpack with that as well. But, you know, I, I know that for us, a lot of it too is just kind of uh, unpacking, you know, uh, the skills, the single file ownership piece. Uh, I know taking first notice of loss, there's some challenges, um, but I think taking the first notice of loss and then that person could handle your large loss. Uh, so we're, we're kind of, you know, things where you would take a claim uh, through an FNOL intake system, uh, then you would have kind of a, uh, an old antiquated kind of triage system. So I, I think the idea is that, you know, we're really looking at how we can efficiently automate where we can get that claim to the right place at the very beginning. And then that, those skill sets really can take it from FNOL all the way to settlement, even on a total loss property claim. So, yeah. I mean, I, I think that it's really just kind of using the tech um, using the available resources that exist in the market and, and really kind of kind of bucking those trends, um, you know, those siloed environments. So, you know, that's kind of what we're working on and what we're finding is it, it's just an overall better experience for the member. Um, and, it, and it just adds a ton of value to the claim. It's probably something, well, something we would have loved to have maybe implemented a long time ago yeah. <laughs> versus just recently. So yeah. that, that kind of what comes to mind. No, that I think that's really it's it's helpful perspective from from the two of you living with this on the daily. Tom, I'm wondering, are you seeing the same thing in the various carriers you work with, and are you able to help them spot some of these moments where, kind of to Lori's point, is we we sort of we realize that this wasn't adding anything, and there's a chance for us to reap some reward if we if we change our decisioning. Certainly. And I think, I think incredibly, if you just think again, think about what's happened the last couple of years, I think there are a lot of sacred cows that have been, that have been challenged, right? Just by virtue of the way the organizations are working now, right? And again, I'll defer to Zach and Lori on, on the, on their day-to-day -day lives, but I think just given that distributed work environment, that's put a much greater need on that, on the upfront engagement side, right? What am I doing stuff? So I think, Lori, you gave a great example about what you're doing on the bi-directional SMS side as an example, right? What you're doing to drive that value. In the past, quite honestly, the industry would have looked at that as a table stakes capability. I need to have something in market that delivers just to kind of keep up with the Joneses. And that was just, a, that was just how it, how the industry ran, frankly, for a while. Mm -hmm. Now it's how does that channel drive value, right? What am I doing to drive value again, both operationally, but also for the end customer simultaneously. So I think you're really looking at how those things they, re, rethinking to a certain extent, you know, all of those touch points. And I think a lot of that's born out of necessity because I think those types of engagements actually mitigate the fact that the 30 year claims modeled where you had sort of everybody on base working from the same sort of centralized function has changed enough that it requires different thinking to be able to start to attack that. And I think that that's where I think a lot of things have become on the table. And I think that that's an area we're seeing, especially on the engagement side, people are pushing to say, okay, we've, we've had this stuff. Now, how do I get greater value out of it, right? Because I think we need to get greater value out of it as an organization in order to be effective. Yeah. Um, I want to jump back into, away from my questions, back into the audience questions. Um, there's one here that, uh, some of you have touched on this a little bit. Actually, Zach, you opened with a comment from underwriting. And so I, I think this one speaks to that. But um, it says, you know, we're, we're seeing a significant investment in claims automation, claims administration, fraud detection, et cetera. Um, what innovation do you expect in the loss prevention and exposure management side? We've all been talking about being proactive in this stuff. And Lori, a lot of the tools that you were talking about for uh, the telematics side, you know, speaks to that exactly. Where do you see, do you see new developments coming there that might stop the claim before it happens rather than just aiding us, you know, with a better mop to, to clean up the water, so to speak? Zach, I don't know if that hit too close to home when I talked about water that needs to be cleaned up. I know that's, that's an issue, but... Um, are you seeing anything, Zach, on the, the prevention side in terms of new innovations coming online that you're hopeful might change the nature and the, the quantity of claims that we see? 
you know, I'll be honest with you, there, there's nothing that comes to mind from a prevention. And really a lot of it's because a lot of what, what drives our claim volume is, is the volatility in the catastrophe space. And, you know, I read something the other day that, you know, either one in three people have experienced some sort of, um, or have been affected by a catastrophe. And, and it seems like the incidence um, of that is just going to continue to increase. So I, 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 if I look at overall claims, um, I, I don't know that I see that there's uh, going to be much prevention and volume. Uh, and it's going to, vary, I think, on, on just weather patterns and, and just, you know, what's happening in the, in the world from a catastrophe perspective. Um, but other types of claims, um, you know, you know, if I think about like kind of fraud detection, you know, I know that there's going to be, you know, tech or well, the tech exists, but, you know, when it, when it gets fully functional, where they're actually looking at thousands of, of pieces of information, running queries in the background, you know, where instead of just having somebody look at a document out of a file folder, they're going to be able to query again thousands of documents in real time, creating a profile, looking at trends and patterns. You know, will it deter people? Um, you know, I, maybe at some point it will, but I don't know how long that'll take. So I, I don't see anything off the top of um, of my head where that it'll actually prevent the claim from being filed yet. Uh, but I do think the tools will be there for us to better. It'll enable us to better adjust. I think some of the risk and some of the exposures. So that's kind of again, that's that's my thoughts on that. Yeah, Laurie, do you feel the same in auto? Do you think it's about enabling better underwriting? What, what are your thoughts here? I, I think even in the home space, I'm going to take a little bit of a, of a different road on that. I think, and Zach had mentioned it with the smart home and the power of the smart home. If customers want to give us that kind of access, there's a lot of capability to potentially prevent um, loss or at least certainly mitigate it. And um, I met with uh, a prospective partner last week and they had given me some ideas like where this SMS uh, communication tool. And if there's hail coming in the area, you could, as a membership organization, especially reach out to customers, protect your family, protect your property. But hey, if you have a car and you're not going to take it with, put it in the garage or take it to a you know high level garage, say there's a water event, a hail event, and we'll pay for the parking so that we don't have to pay for the hail claim. So there's a lot of different ways, I think, to leverage um, AI, because at this point we would be using AI to, to chat out. And on the auto side with the capabilities in the connected car, I was on a webinar with um, a colleague from the Ohio Turnpike, and he was giving us a lot of great insights in what they're doing with the OEs. And there's so much in that connected car. I mean, look what Tesla's doing in terms of the moat they're building around the customers. You buy your car, buy your insurance, uh, get your vehicle repaired at our uh, centers. And our collision center, we, we can detect the loss, it's, it's frictionless. So I think that there's a lot that we can leverage on the connected car side and even on the telematic side to help uh, predict and prevent versus detect and repair. You're breaking problems, you have yeah. your batteries low, you know, and we sell batteries at ACG as a membership organization. So I see a lot of things in the ecosystem that can help the customer take care of their property to deter loss, hopefully, yeah. or, or prevent it. It is, it is a different look at how we spend those indemnity or potential indemnity dollars. I always say, do we want to pay for the house to be tented for termites or we don't do that, so, but we'll pay for it once it collapses because the termites ate all the wood and the you know part of the house dropped. Um, that's insured. But uh, And of course, once you knew there were termites and you chose not to do anything, now we may deny the claim. So that's even, that's, that's not going to bode well for retention, though it certainly would for indemnity. Um, but yeah, it, it's a different mindset, right? And uh, could we replace the battery or could we get them better pricing on it or yeah, pay for their parking? That's a brilliant one. Because um, obviously that would be fantastic not to have all these dented hood, hoods and roofs and mm -hmm. trunks and whatnot. Um, especially on Teslas, they're very expensive to work on. Um, Tom, any thoughts from you about ways to start to use technology proactively to avoid loss? Yeah, I think increasingly, I, I, to, to build on what Zach was saying a little bit, I think you're going to see more of that virtuous cycle between claims and underwriting come into play here. And I think we're, we're already seeing that, that there's more emphasis even on you know, the, the impact of lost data in terms of what that means to that upfront acquisition process, right? Through co-find issue, how you can start to do it. So specifically, I'll tell you, we're seeing growing appetite and fraud right now as an example around that to how do we start to leverage the fraud that's been teased out as part of claims first that can then extend 
forward into the into the quote you know quote to bind process essentially to be able to deliver that how do you start to, to use that differently to actually mitigate even the the operational risk right the organizational risk up front to try to drive that but i think you know there's also that opportunity through the, through the claims process to begin to start to identify again more of those touch points that you can leverage as that data proliferates to start to drive more of that risk mitigation i think some great examples laura you gave even but more, even more interesting i don't know if anybody saw that there's a lawsuit today through Tesla around some somebody was charged um, an increased premium rates based off of false Tesla data, right, in terms of their stop stuff. So I think that there's a lot the industry is still wrestling with around sort of how, how it starts to be able to apply that quickly. But I think that is just going to naturally flow into multiple areas, both on, on the claims that I also say in the acquisition side, as this stuff becomes even more tightly integrated over time. Um, I think we could have a whole webinar on Tesla yeah. and their insurance, and but that's a that's a whole other conversation. But it's fascinating, totally. and of course they're probably at the forefront from what data is out there in the vehicles. And of course, every time one of them crashes, they're very quick to say that autopilot or FSD was not engaged. But maybe, maybe not. They own the data. Certainly, um, very I fascinating know. discussion. But yeah, thank you for that. We we have I think time for this one last question, and it's a great one. Um, and I, I think everyone will have something to contribute to this, but it's a question about the trade-off between top-down versus bottom-up when it comes to this stuff. So the, the person's asking, you know, from your experience, is your enterprise doing this more as a top-down? You know, the executive suite is saying, this is what we're going to do and we're going to push ahead with this. Or is it coming more from the bottom-up, more tactical solutions that when you start to piece this together, we sort of woke up with an AI and, uh, and decisioning kind of strategy and solution in place. What do you see one way or the other in your organization? And the question goes on to saying, is there a better answer? Um, is it black and white? Does it have to be one or the other? How do you see navigating this? And I will say going back a couple of weeks to the AI and Innovative Tech USA event that Reuters hosted, this came up there too. People were asking about how do we actually do this? And what's the right answer between executive buy-in and pushing of it versus of the people, you know, coming up from the adjusters or the underwriters or what have you. Um, and that made for a great conversation. So I'm excited for what everyone has to add here. Um, Zach, you were the, the first to speak last time, so you can continue to be and everyone's voice gets to rest the same amount. What, what are some thoughts on your end on this? Um, you know, it, I think it, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, I, I would say there's a lot of top, a uh, lot of top down approaches uh, you know, and I think the, the question, or at least the statement, it's worded a little bit interesting, because I, I don't think it's that simple. So I would say a lot of it does come from, you know, senior leadership down, um, and it could affect one particular department. So for example, it could affect claims, it could affect uh, the homeowners department. But, you know, for example, you could make a telephony change. Um, you know, whether you change extensions, people have direct dial numbers, and we could have a preference. Um, secondly, though, there could be a, an enterprise wide need to change the technology or to increase the technology where maybe we're like, hey, our customers aren't having a tough time getting a hold of us. We're not having a tough time answering the phone and we're not having uh, any challenges reaching out to them. So I, I think that, you know, you have to look at kind of the bigger picture um, versus just how does it affect me, but how does it affect the enterprise? Because I do think that there's a lot of maybe top down approaches that make sense from an enterprise perspective, even if they don't necessarily make sense. Um, um, from a specific departmental perspective. You know, we all kind of don't all agree with certain decisions or directions, but there's usually a method to the madness that I find. Um, it enhances the enterprise strategy or the ability for the enterprise to evolve and, and become more efficient. Um, so I think that that's one takeaway. Um, you know, at the same time, I do find that um, I think people do kind of struggle to evolve uh, with technology. So in, in thinking of, you have adjusters that kind of like to do things the way they've done them. It, it's comfortable. Um, there's a lot of risk out there, obviously, with indemnity and severity. Um, I think the advent of COVID has helped kind of force us to think differently as well. You know, a lot of the technology that we're implementing, it, you know, the processes were on our roadmaps, you know, but maybe they were 2023, 2024. No, they're not. They're 2020, yeah, <laughs> you know? Right. And so, um, so I think the, I think the, the frontline worker, I think they're getting more comfortable historically, maybe more just kind of set in their ways, but evolving. So I, I think those are some things that I think of. Usually there's a method to the madness. 
usually the frontline employee might have some apprehension um, about changing certain processes that work. But I think that we're evolving and we've been kind of forced to, and I think we're getting a lot better at it. So that's kind of what I think uh, when it comes to that question. That, that's great. Lori, similar, different? What's your view on this? I have a, a similar view. We just recently completed a greenhouse two weeks ago. It was the claim senior leaders, and it was our C-suite across insurance, technology, digital, our lean process improvement team. And there were about 30 of us that went up to Chicago and we were visioning. Uh, we uh, had stakeholder interviews prior to that uh, particular meeting and we had curls of wisdom and we were voting on what's going to drive the needle and talking about effortless experiences and really creating the groundwork for a coalesced and collaborative uh, really claim roadmap of the future. So I felt like that was a really productive exercise where you really had leaders across the organization from really our uh, producer side all the way through to our technology partners. And it was a very productive exercise. And I'm really very optimistic about how we're going, to, we were all at the table and how we're going to move uh, our effortless claim experience aspirations forward. And so I think it gave us an opportunity to provide perspective, but also leaders across the organization that might be at the beginning of the insurance experience and not the fulfillment on the claim of delivering on the promise side. So um, I think it has to be a collaborative effort for it to uh, succeed. And then we're very focused when we roll out these intelligent automation initiatives to focus on organizational change management for the customer, for our adjusters. And so we're very tuned in around understanding our communities, action planning, digital agents, uh, being having a more inspired way to introduce change and giving the voice of our customer and our adjusters post go live that opportunity to give us better vision on where we could tweak and make their lives easier. Of that more collaborative and recognizing both of you, there's no single answer. It depends on what you're talking about. And you do have to think about the people and how they're going to adopt it. So, you know, involving them in it, whether it came from them or it was thrust upon them, but hearing from both sides and, and you need to buy in up top as well. Tom, any, any, uh, you're going to get the closing words, but yeah. any thoughts from you on this? Cause you've got a carrier background as well. So you've seen lots of different contexts here. Yeah, and I think just generally, right, I think you absolutely need to have that leadership engagement, right? Obviously, that sponsorship is, is a key thrust into that alignment there, because I think I think at that level, there generally is a belief that this is something that needs to, an investment that needs to be made for the future, right, and how we get there. But the fact is, momentum is built incrementally from uh, from the bottom up, right? When you start to do that, I think these initiatives in and of themselves need to be successful from the bottom as you work up, but do that in, again in an incremental way and start to look at something. We're not just in, we're not just doing AI generally today, and that's what we do. It's more how do we tactically start to attack value and start to build that momentum, and then it just becomes part of the organization's DNA over time. And I think I think just folks on this phone, right? I think you're seeing that investment that's been made in, in that type of approach in, in market today, and I think that that's what's delivering value. I think that. That's how carriers are successful here, but not just saying we do this, but actually starting tactically to look at those incremental improvements and then just build that into competency over time. And I think that becomes something that's, as you mentioned, the, the employees, which maybe not don't want to work quite as differently. Again, it becomes part of their role and it becomes something that they're just customary to, accustomed to on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that that's how you start to build real value and start to get the organization to push behind this, to, to build it really value for the, for the business as well as the end customers over time. Well, I lied, Tom. You're not going to get the final word. I am, but um, go for spot it. On. No, I think that, I think that was excellent. You know, we we are just coming up on the hour, and I think there were a few themes that kept coming up throughout all of these conversations, from the opening comments to the way that um, each one of the people on the panel answered the questions. There's a clear one around flexibility, and I think this point, you know, this last question really hit that is. There is no rote answer, just like there is no 17.3% is the number of, you know, that, that we strive for in automation or what have you is we need to look at the context. Context came up quite a bit. We need to think more holistically about what we're trying to solve for, what tools we have at our disposal, how that impacts our people, our customers, our organization more broadly. Um, this is a collaborative effort. And that speaks to this notion of it's not just AI or a specific tool or a specific vendor. It's decisioning, right? It's the broader 
idea of what we're doing, which is the heart of this work. Everything is a complex decision in this world. So let's think about our solutions that way and the way we arrive at those thresholds and implementations and ways we use them so we can get the most benefit out of them. Um, and I'll just, I'll leave everyone at that. Flexibility, communication, partnering. If you don't have that sort of community mentality, then you end up in the same old, same old of disparate tools, you know, all the uh, different post-it notes around your monitor with all the different logins. And remember, if you're doing this, do that. And they've got flow charts. No one wants to work that way. And the good news is we don't have to. Uh, we just have to go in with the right attitude. So Zach, Lori, Tom, thank you so much for the thoughts today. Thank you to everyone who tuned in and the great questions that came through. Of course, we couldn't even scratch the surface on most of them that came in, but I thought we got to some really good ones. So thank you to the audience for that. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.